So we do need to remember all the different factoring techniques that you've learned. And if you go back to section 1.3, there's a factoring section. It starts on page 17. And it's a nice review of all the different factoring techniques. We learn them in a particular order because factoring out the greatest common factor is always the thing you should try to do first. Then we learn factor by grouping. We only use that one when there's four terms. So you need to learn to recognize terms. So if I have 4x cubed minus 3x squared plus 5x minus 1, that has four terms. So that's the only time we would think about factor by grouping when there's four terms. Then a trinomial has three terms. And so those are the guys where you turn it into a product with two binomials that each have x in the front when the leading coefficient is 1. When the leading coefficient is not 1, that gets a little trickier. So let me do an example of one of those. So I'm going to show you how I would make the problem up. I would go 2x minus 3 times, say, 3x plus 1. So that's going to give me 6x cubed uh, squared plus 2x minus 9x minus 3. So then combine my like terms, and I'll get 6x squared minus 7x minus 3. People have lots of different ways of factoring, and any way that you have is fine with me. I just want to show you a method in case you don't have one. So the leading coefficient is called a and the constant is called c, and this method is called the ac method to remind you how to get it started. So ac, when you see two letters together like that, means multiply them. So 6 times negative 3 is negative 18, and I like to use this big x just to help me think. So I need two numbers that multiply together to negative 18, but that add up to negative 7. So I just make a systematic list. I say the factors of 18 could be 1 and 18. No way to get 7 with those. 2 and 9. Oh, I see if I have negative 9 and 2, that will multiply to negative 18 and add up to negative 7. So then I use those two numbers to break apart this middle term and rewrite it as negative 9x plus 2x, because if you find two numbers like this and break the middle term in that way, it will factor by grouping. So now you see I have four terms, so I'm going to factor by grouping. So I'm going to pair up the first pair and say, what's the GCF for this pair? Well, I see a 3 and an x. And then what's left inside my parentheses is 2x minus 3. And then the next two guys don't have any common factor except 1. So if it's helpful to write the 1, then you can. And then we say, look, I have a common binomial. So I'm going to factor out the common binomial. And what's left? 3x plus 1. So that's the AC method, if you'd like to use that. So then we have the difference of squares and the sum and difference of cubes. These guys only ever have two terms, right? Because it's either the sum of two squares or the difference of two squares or the sum of two cubes or the difference of two cubes. So those formulas are in the book, but a quick refresh. If you have A squared minus B squared, that's a difference of squares and it factors to a plus b, a minus b, so hopefully that seems familiar. And then the sum and difference of cubes, if I have a cubed plus b cubed, what I'm going to get is a and b, then a squared, a times b, and b squared. Then I'm going to get the same sign as what I started with, then the opposite sign, and then always positive. So then if I want to do the difference of cubes, I'll still have a and b and a squared and a, b and b squared, but now I have the same sign I started with, the opposite sign, 
and always positive. So when you're looking for these squares, you'll have even exponents. If you're looking for some in difference of cubes, there'll be multiples of three exponents and perfect cube numbers like 8 and 27 and 64. So look for those. Then quadratic in form, those are a little trickier. So let me take a moment and talk about if I start with x squared minus 2 times x squared plus 3, well, my result when I FOIL is going to be x to the fourth plus 3x squared minus 2x squared minus 6. So combine like terms, get x to the fourth plus x squared minus 6. Well, this is called quadratic in form because it looks sort of like the quadratic of ax squared plus bx plus c only I have it to the fourth power here and to the second power here. Well, as long as this relationship is true, like you could have ax to the sixth plus bx cubed plus c, that is also considered quadratic in form. So when you go to factor those, some people find it useful to let u equal x squared or some other letter, you can use W or whatever letter you like. Well, then U squared is going to equal X to the fourth. So I can substitute and rewrite my quadratic in form as a regular quadratic with U. And then that might help you see how to factor it and say, oh, I know how to do this one. This is U plus three times U minus two. And then you say, oh, well, u wasn't what I started with. x squared is, so let me put back the x squared now that I see the form. Okay, so do as much factoring practice as you need to to become fluent in it once again. And I'll show you why we need to be able to factor. So in this next example, if you just plug in the two, Let's see what happens, because you always try that first. Try plugging in the two, see what happens. So I'll have four minus 10 plus six, that's a zero. And four minus 12 plus eight, that's a zero. Uh-oh, nothing ever equals zero over zero. So this is not working, and we need to go back to the drawing board and factor. So the limit of that ratio is the limit of factor the numerator and factor the denominator. And if you get zero over zero, there will be matching factors, so you can use that to help with your factoring. And then I'm showing you using correct notation. So when I say using correct notation, I mean using the LIM when it should be there and not having it when it shouldn't be there. Well, this next step, it still needs to be here because I still have X's. So I'm saying the limit as x goes to 2 of x minus 3 over x minus 4. Now I plug in the number for the x, and then I don't need the LIM. So I have 2 minus 3 over 2 minus 4. So negative 1 over negative 2 or 1 half. So this limit does exist. We couldn't find it by just plugging in 2. But the graph that has the hole in it because of the matching factor still has a limit. So the hole is at 2 comma 1 half. Right? That's not a point on the graph. That's a hole in the graph. Okay, then I just want to refresh your memory on what happens if you have a number and you're dividing by something that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, that means the ratio is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And so if when you plug in a number, you get a number over zero, so if you get the limit as x goes to five of whatever this function is, and you get seven over zero, that's not your answer. It's going to be does not exist because this says it's going towards infinity. So you never are going to leave a zero in a denominator. So then if you have zero over a number, that's fine. That limit is zero. So keep in mind the distinction between zero and the denominator, bad. Zero and the numerator, fine. And then if you ever get zero over zero, that's never going to be your 